Prior to European settlement, open canopy forests covered as much as three quarters of the southeastern coastal plain. These forests were predominantly two-layered with an overstory of widely spaced pines and a diverse grass forb shrub ground cover that was maintained by frequent fires. Additionally, pine and pine oak savannas occurred on the xeric ridges of the ridge and valley and the Piedmont physiographic provinces. However, dramatic change has occurred over the last 150 years. The drastic loss of pine savanna due to conversion to other land use types, intensive forest management, and reduction of fire occurrence and frequency has contributed to a severe decline in bob whites and numerous other species. Although longleaf and shortleaf pine savannas readily come to mind, other species of southern yellow pine, like loblolly and slash, can be prescriptively managed with thinning, prescribed burning, and other techniques to restore and maintain a functional pine savanna ground cover to benefit bob whites and associated wildlife. Hello, I'm Steve Chapman, Forestry Coordinator for the National Bob White Conservation Initiative. We tell landowners that are interested in pine savanna and bob white habitat that they need to thin and burn, but there's more detail to it than that. If you're a natural resource professional who has a landowner that is interested in restoring pine savanna and bob white habitat, this video will explain how to do that. We've invited Reggie Thaxton a certified wildlife biologist to assist us with this video. Reggie has over 35 years experience with integrating management for bob whites and other wildlife into southern yellow pine systems. The vision that most quail hunters in the southeast have is a beautiful covey rise out in open pine savanna. And that is what we're after when we're managing pine stands for quail. But the fact is, quail are not really a forest bird. So the question is not how many trees do we need, but how many trees can we have and still have quail. Quail are a grass forb shrub species. Some people lump them in as a grassland bird. They're a bird that thrives in an open savanna condition with vegetation from chest high down. They really don't have to have a tree. Uh, to do well, and that's evident when you go out into the prairie states and see quail thriving in western Texas and west Oklahoma, for example. But we can have trees and still have quail with the proper management, and those trees provide uh, a, a, a multitude of other benefits, one of course being an economic return to the landowner. So when we go to manage a, a pine stand for quail, what, what our target objective is and research shows this, that quail need about a third each of native grass, uh, forbs and legumes and shrubs, all intermixed together throughout the understory of the forest, the ground cover of the forest. So that's the goal when we set out to manage a pine stand for quail is that rule of thirds. Thinning is that first step uh, on a closed canopy stand to open it up, to let sunlight into the ground, to restore the ground cover for bob whites and these other savanna dependent species. But all thinning is not created equal. It has to be the right level of thinning and that varies by tree species and site quality. For example, uh, longleaf pine blocks about a third less sunlight than does loblolly or slash pine. So we can carry a little higher stocking rate of longleaf and still get a, a, a good ground cover growth than we can with loblolly or slash pine. Another factor that really is important when you're going to thin a stand is to think about the site that you're on. Uh, a wet or hydric site, for example, like in the lower coastal plain, uh, does not need to be thinned as heavy as would a uh, more well-drained site or particularly a, a more xeric site. Uh, if we thin too heavy on these wet sites, then we make them actually wetter because we've removed the trees that are taking up the moisture and helping keep that site uh, dried out. But across most sites uh, in the southeast, keeping pine stands within a 40 to 60 or 65 basal area range is, is the desired target to grow the kind of ground cover we need. Here I'm gonna talk about uh, 
basal area, which is a measurement that foresters and biologists use to measure density in forested stands in both hardwood and pine. And basal area is a cross-sectional measurement of all the trees summed up, measured at 48 inches that are expressed in square feet per acre. To measure basal area, we typically use a prism and the prism I have here is a 10 factor prism, which means you would measure your trees on a, on a plot and with a 10 factor prism, you would multiply that times 10 and that would give you your total square feet of basal area. So what you would do, you would hold the prism out about arm's length and you, you want to hold it at about 48 inches on the tree and you'll measure your trees going around the plot and you want to hold the prism over plot center. So here we've got one, two, three, and then four trees that fall on this plot. So that means we've got a basal area of 40 square feet right here on this site. If you were to go through the rest of this stand taking plots, you would take the square feet of basal area on each plot, add those up, and then divide by the number of plots. And that would give you your average square feet of basal area in the entire stand. What we see around us here is a pine stand that's been recently thinned here on Dylane Wildlife Management Area. It's been thinned down to a basal area of, of 40 square feet per acre to allow sunlight into the forest floor. But that just removes one layer of the cover from, from the overstory that is shading out the desirable plant species that we need to benefit Bob Whites and the other critters that use this kind of habitat. We also have to think about the mid-story, what's under those trees and taking it out, as well as the ground layer cover that comes from pine needles and leaves, as well as the vegetation growing here to keep it in this open, savanna-like condition. Thinning alone will not a pine savanna create. Uh, what we have to do is couple thinning with prescribed fire. If we don't burn, then we end up getting a quick, rapid regrowth, particularly in the southeast with our long growing seasons and high rainfall. We get a regrowth of hardwood and uh, pine and other plants that, that soon shade out the ground cover we're wanting to produce. So prescribed fire is the tool that we use to really manage that cover. And with prescribed fire for quail and other pine savanna species, it's real important to think about the frequency of the fire, the scale of the fire, that is how big areas you're burning, and the season of the fire. But frequency is most important of all. Across most sites in the southeast, uh, long-term fire research plots at tall timbers and other areas show that you need, on the average, a two-year fire return interval. That is, burn every other year. But you, that ties into scale and we don't want to be burning large areas. Bob whites are a species of low mobility. There's other species that are also of low mobility like gopher tortoises, uh, pollinators, and smaller burn units benefit these species by uh, keeping their movements restricted and not exposing them to excessive predation in, the, in, the terms, of, in terms of quail. So a, a good uh, average scale of burn is 60 acres or less. It's a function though of size and shape. So we can, we can burn larger than that if the burns are long and narrow as opposed to square or round uh, with a lot of interior area. So frequency of burn two year, scale of burn uh, 60 acres or less if, if possible. And then finally a season of burn. And if we burn in the winter time, we call that dormant season burns. And uh, it's, it produces a different result through time than do growing season burns. In the growing season, we have early growing season, mid growing season, and late growing season. A general rule for, for quail management in the southeast is to burn between March 1 and May 15. 
and to spread that burning out across those burn units that are intermixed across the landscape like a checkerboard, uh, to spread that burning out through that season and through time because different plants have different flowering chronologies. And so burning at the same time every year works in the favor of some plant species and, and, but works against others. Whereas if the burn timing is spread out during that period, then you're, you're favoring a greater diversity of the kind of plants we're wanting out there in, uh, in that habitat. And an important point to make about fire is this not an event that, that produces a, a result in one burn. It takes many years of burning to really develop the kind of uh, composition, species composition and structure that you're wanting in a forest stand. So it, burning is a process, not an event. But through time, it produces the kind of quality habitat that we want to see for Bob Whites and these other species. The staff here at Dylane burned this uh, stand back in March and it's, we've had a good bit of rain. It's coming back very nice. And it's important to point out that these current year burns or provide brood habitat for quail. And the reason it's brood habitat, you can see these plants coming up here, but you also see underneath these plants, it's very open, a lot of bare ground underneath. And that's what the quail chicks, which are about the size of your thumb, need to be able to move around and capture insects, which, which they have to have for for a rapid body growth, a high protein source. So when we think about the burning and that mix of, of different uh, uh, cover types, what we want is last year's burn right next to this year's burn. That way we have nesting cover in the two year growth and brood range in this current year's burn that's recovering. And research at Tall Timbers Game Bird Program has shown that uh, with radioed birds that you see just through from, from spring on through summer, you just see increasing use of, of adults and broods of the current year's burn as it's recovering. That's in, in getting to the height that they feel secure and are able to, to forage on insects uh, efficiently in those kinds of habitats. So that scale of burn where we, where we have these small blocks like a checkerboard of unburned cover and burn cover throughout a stand provides the ideal situation for Bob Whites for nesting and brood rearing. And when we talk about bare dirt, the need of bare dirt for quail, we're not talking about a harrowed up field with no cover. What we're talking about is where, in this case, prescribed fire has been removed, used to remove the thatch on the ground and then generate the forbs above it so that the bare dirt is actually underneath a protective canopy cover and the chicks can move freely through there on that bare dirt, uh, get foraging for insects, but they're still protected above by cover, which protects them from, from predators, as well as provides shade during the hot summer months. We talked about the importance of burning on a small scale, 60 acres or less, so that we've got this mix of, of a current year's burn and a previous year's burn to provide that nesting cover next to brood range. The stand we're in here was burned uh, last year, so it has one growing season. It's about to enter its second growing season, and it provides right now that example of that one-third each mix of native grass, forbs, legumes, and uh, woody cover that quail need uh, and it's really functioning right now in the spring and early summer, it's functioning as nesting cover uh, for, for quail in great part. And we want this right beside the current year's burn that we looked at earlier so that when, they, when the birds hatch, they can move right out into that burn or to a fallow opening to brood. Uh, we see a lot of diversity in here on the ground cover. There's different species of legumes, the pea family plants, that are preferred quail foods and great for other wildlife too, uh, and pollinators that are coming in. And, uh, and this, this hardwood that I'm standing by, you can see the top is dead and that was from that fire year before last. Uh, so it girdled this hardwood and now it's sprouting back uh, following the fire. And uh, if we don't burn this again next year, then pretty soon we'll lose it. It'll grow up into that mid-story of hardwood that we, that we don't want. 
So we want to keep it managed like it is with fire and with some chemical mechanical treatments where we need them to keep that one third each mix of native grass, forbs legumes and woody cover. In addition to providing food and escape cover, these second year roughs are really important for nesting cover in these thin and burned woodlands. Uh, Bob White's nest in, the, in, in dead vegetation from the previous year and one of their preferred nesting covers are in the clumps of native warm season grass like Virginia blue stem as we see here in this, uh, in this shot. What they do is they, they come in and, and actually tunnel out a nest uh, in that clump of the, of the dead vegetation so they're, they're covered from the sides and above and, uh, and that's where they lay their clutch of eggs which on the average is 12 and, uh, and then they incubate for uh, 23 days and so this native warm season grass that we want a third of out here on this landscape along with the forbs and the woody cover is, uh, is very important for, for, for good nesting cover. Particularly across sites that have once been in agriculture, which is most of the southeastern United States, uh, you also have to use, at times, mechanical and or chemical treatments along with the fire and the thinning. Again, pre prescriptively applied, depending on the site conditions, to really achieve the ideal uh, cover, food and cover, that you're after. Uh, going in after, after a burn and where we have large clumps of hardwood, uh, mowing those down uh, to, to give the grasses, the fuel for fire, a chance to come up so that the, that hardwood can be controlled in future burns is a good technique. On larger areas, clumps of hardwood within a burn unit, then going in and spraying with the appropriate chemical, and that can depend on, that varies again by site. Uh, it, can also be very beneficial in helping keep that desired mix of ground cover. Our desired ground cover mix for Bob Whites and many other species is a third each of, of native grass, forbs and legumes, and woody cover shrubs, for example. So uh, when we target a site for pine savanna restoration, we use that rule of thirds uh, is what we're trying to ultimately get to and sustain. When that woody cover creeps above 50%, then it's definitely time for us to go in and do some mechanical chemical treatments or use perhaps a late mid to late growing season burn to set that woody cover back and uh, keep the proper balance out there on the ground. Across the southeastern quail range, often what we're working with in quail restoration is trying to integrate quail management in with working farm and forest lands uh, in a situation where we're blending commercial row crop management with fallow edge management and then adjacent pine stand management. We see all of that in this landscape. We've got a wheat crop here. We've got a fallow field border that's got nesting cover and uh, escape cover and beyond it is a thinned and burned pine stand that provides all the amenities of a pine savanna. So while there are economic trade-offs, quail management can be effectively integrated into these working farm and forest landscapes. And it actually produces, when you manage both the edges of the crop field and the pine stand that's adjacent, it actually produces a synergistic effect for the quail population. One of the components that goes along with managing a forest stand for quail and other wildlife are loading docks, and that's where they skid the logs up and delimb the trees to load them to haul them to the mill. It creates openings within the forest that can be very beneficial to a number of wildlife species, and the management of these can actually even enhance those benefits further. Uh, we're standing in a loading deck here uh, from, a, from the logging this past winter, and you can already see the ragweed and a lot of other forbs coming up here that's going to provide good brood habitat for quail. Research through the Tall Timbers Game Bird Program has shown that across a variety of sites, these openings can be very important in terms of insect production to benefit quail broods. Uh, ideally, what we like to see where openings are needed is uh, two to five acre openings that comprise about 20 percent 
or so of the forest uh, landscape and then manage these not with food plot planting but with natural vegetation like ragweed and partridge pea and some of the other species that come in after soil disturbance. And the way we do that is disc in the winter. Uh, sometimes uh, the seed bank may, be not, not, may not be present and we may have to plant ragweed and partridge pea initially, but then after that the disking will keep it generated uh, through time. And so you disc each winter in these openings to, to bring on ragweed, partridge pea and these other, other species. It's also important on these sites, uh, initially at least, to subsoil them, to break up the hard pan because of the heavy equipment that's been on the site. And it's also important to keep them limed to a pH of around six or 6.5 so that you get that kind of cover growth that's really needed by quail. And so these loading decks, uh, while they can be unsightly in the beginning, can become really valuable in the uh, quail management program later. So we'll burn this slash pile and uh, smooth this side out. And then from then on, it'll be managed in a very beneficial way for Bob Whites and some other wildlife species through that annual winter disking uh, to encourage ragweed and partridge pea and other forbs. We talked earlier about, about how fire alone often will not keep the ground cover in the in the desired condition and that's particularly true on land that has once been farmed and this all of this land around us here uh, was cotton farmed back in the late 1800s and early 1900s and so in addition to fire we periodically have to apply herbicide on a very prescriptive basis to keep the hardwood and other woody cover uh, under control and at, the, and at the desired distribution and composition that we're after for quail. And uh, in this case, what we see are hardwoods that have been uh, sprayed now with, with a chemical triclopyr, which kills the broadleaf plants, but doesn't kill the native grass. And so what we're doing here is we're removing some of this woody cover chemically, and in the process releasing the native grass and some of the other plants that provide fuel for fire, along with the pine needles, and keep that one third each mix of native grass, forbs, legumes, and woody cover that we're after to benefit Bob Whites and other wildlife. So if you own farm and forest land together, you can effectively manage for quail. Uh, the fallow field borders and hedgerows, just like the pine woods that we've talked about, need periodic disturbance, either through uh, fire, rotational disking, herbicide, combination of all three to keep that mix of of uh, nesting cover and brood range and keeping it from, from going to trees. But the best way to start, the key to making that happen on the landscape is getting a professional wildlife biologist out on the property to lay out a plan before you ever begin. It'll end up giving you a better return on your investment and keeping you from uh, putting money where it doesn't need to go. And uh, that's the most important point of all of this is quail management is very site specific and it need, you need a professional with quail management experience, whether it's a private consultant, a state agency, or a federal biologist, uh, or one of the NGOs to uh, work with you and develop that plan for your forest and your ag lands and your openings to make it the best it can be for Bob Whites and these other game and non-game wildlife species.